Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. The purpose of this video is going to be to discuss subterranean bunkers, more specifically to discuss the psychological, emotional, and psychosocial challenges that may well present themselves when cohabitating with others in an environment in which space is limited, where supplies need to be rationed, and where the only rule of law is the ones that the inhabitants can uphold for themselves. If proper attention is not paid to these issues, the outcome for the survivors may be as bad as the disaster that prompted them to retreat into the bunker in the first place. Now in order to produce this video, I drew from a couple different streams of research. So one of these streams was research conducted by NASA who routinely psychologically screen their astronauts to ensure that they can endure the rigors of spaceflight, as well as research done on prison populations, particularly prisoners who've been forced into some sort of isolation, but in the general prison population as well. Lastly, my personal background in psychology and mental health in combination with this research was harnessed in order to attempt to brainstorm about the possible challenges and coping strategies of residing in a shit hits the fan bunker long term. This of course is for the sake of entertainment and amusement alone, as the likelihood of an event happening that would warrant the long term unending retreat into a doomsday bunker is extremely low. It would have to be a very unique confluence of factors and circumstances that force people into these bunkers long term, which is not to say it is impossible just that it's unlikely. The bunker really is the ultimate bug-in prep. Now the majority of shelters of course are only meant for short-term use. Storm shelters of course would fall into this category. There are however a small minority of personal shelters and more recently more large-scale commercial ones which are being fashioned for extended use. This isn't even counting of course the military and government ones that we the civilian population are not privy to know about. But the focus for this talk for the sake of interest and amusement alone is going to be the doomsday bunker. So is the doomsday bunker merely some post-apocalyptic isolationist fantasy in its most extreme form? Is it something worth the labor required to see it through? These are questions perhaps for another video. I'm not here to discuss the validity of long-term bunkers. Rather, the purpose of this talk, generally speaking, is going to be the psychology of surviving in confined spaces with groups of people that you may not know for prolonged periods of time. And when I say prolonged periods of time, I mean anything that is even over the 72 hour mark. Because every hour in a bunker may well feel like a day depending on who you're sharing the space with. Now a lot of companies as of late are selling space within large scale underground bunkers. These are subterranean communes of sorts. Vivos, Logic Incorporated and some other smaller scale companies which cater to personal bunkers are spearheading a growing market for doomsday bunkers. Now the catch with a lot of these large scale bunker constructions is that they have shared facilities, meaning that several people who do not know each other are planning on conglomerating to them in the case of a full blown shit hits the fan situation. Now although the companies who design these bunkers have paid some attention to and are cognizant of the psychosocial challenges that might present themselves in these bunkers, it's important that people who are considering purchasing their own bunker or buying stake in one of these large scale projects understands the potential for things to go severely awry within them. And just to promote a general awareness about the psychological sensitivities of bugging in long term. Now the main premise for this talk is going to be the idea that human beings or most living things for that matter are not meant to live in confined spaces. We are meant to be free. Movement is life as the saying goes. But because we're talking about a confined space, I do believe that the most important rule above all else whether a small scale or a large scale bunker or in any survival situation in general with large groups of people is an agreed upon set of rules, regulations, routines, schedules, some sort of regimen that demarcate clear cut boundaries on what is and what isn't acceptable behavior. This is going to be absolutely essential. In a situation where people must ration their resources, where they are crammed together, where they are deprived perhaps claustrophobic, 
Perhaps they are grieving the loss of whatever they are running from, being forced to leave all the modern amenities of life behind and all the other stresses that they might have encountered along the way. The dysphoric nature of the whole situation and the uncertainty of what to expect, above all else, order and governance will be absolutely essential, if not primary, to maintaining peace within this environment. Now unfortunately, this is going to be a libertarian's nightmare. But the fact is, people can only be free if they are physically free. People trapped in a bunker cannot by definition be free without descending into chaos. So within this environment, order will absolutely be necessary. Some level of governance is going to be required. Psychology will play an absolutely crucial role in bunker survival. Mental health first aid is going to be essential. In fact, a mental health professional may well be required in some of these larger facilities and it's indeed something that the companies who are making these larger bunkers ideally would like to see of course it's highly improbable that everybody who is planning on going to these places is actually going to make it there but it's reassuring for people like myself to know who work in this field that there may actually be a very small small niche market for mental health practitioners in a post-collapse environment. Now, equally important to all the life-sustaining features of a doomsday bunker will be the ones that cater to maintaining the serenity of the human mind. If people cannot mentally keep it together, all of the other systems are going to be in vain. Now, imagine with you will all the little nuances of bunker life and the things that can go awry. Now, someone might freak out and break for the door. Someone becomes very depressed and suicidal. Perhaps in breaking for the door and trying to get out of the facility, they're putting others at risk of contamination of whatever's in the air or whatever calamity you've tried to escape. Perhaps disease befalls some of the inhabitants. You know, you're faced with the decision. Do you exile them? Is there a place to quarantine them? You know, what if somebody becomes tyrannical or oppositional? That could lead to conflict, which could totally destroy the colony from the inside out. Uh, what if somebody is taking more rations than they're entitled to? What if others fall mentally ill? There's so many little nuances to bunker survival that I don't think a lot of people have considered. And now these things could transpire in a matter of hours, never mind days or weeks or months even years that some people are planning on residing in these bunkers for. Now, I want to turn people's attention to the Mars One program and this program is trying to send people to colonize Mars in 2023. It's a mission which is going to be a one-way ticket so people aren't going to be able to come back at least not in the foreseeable future as we don't have the technology to bring them back yet. But they're trying to find suitable candidates who can not only endure the physical challenges of space flight, but also the psychological ones of being bound into a small space for many, many years, if not decades, if not the rest of their life. So of course, in selecting these individuals, stringent psychological testing and screening is being utilized in order to shrink a pool of over a million people down into a few dozen who will be groomed for this trip. Now, with respect to doomsday condos, the conditions are very similar. It's an enclosed space where the luxury of leaving is not a possibility. Now, the problem with a lot of these companies who are trying to sell these condos, these doomsday condos as they call them, and stock within these underground bunkers, is that they don't really care who is buying them. It's a business, of course, and whoever is able to buy them and whoever comes to them with money is going to get their place in this bunker. There's no screening process to determine who is psychologically fit to reside within these places, who is emotionally stable, any background checks, things of that nature. So that is going to be a big problem. Now, I want to get one thing out of the way real quick because I'm sure some of the more graduated preppers are thinking about this. And it's this issue that you're going to be able to make it to this doomsday quote unquote condo in the first place. Now, if the shit hits the fan, you're lucky if you make it there in the first place. And secondly, you're lucky if the people inside who've made it there first are going to open the blast-proof doors and allow you to come in. Really, your money, your pink slip, and any sort of honor system is not going to make a whole much of a difference when we're talking about without rule of law, full-blown post-collapse environment type situation. People are hoping that the people in charge of these facilities are going to honor their word in letting them in. But the fact is, that may well not be the case. So I just wanted to get that out of the way right away. Now I want to talk a bit about uh, this Doomsday Bunker show. There was an episode of Doomsday Bunkers. It could have been Doomsday Preppers, I'm not sure. 
But a family within that show did a trial run. It was a simulation of what it would be like to stay in their bunker that they had just purchased. I think it was a shipping container and they outfitted it with, you know, furniture and a few small amenities and stuff like that. And I believe there was about 10 of them. And after a few hours, people were already getting very anxious and irritable. So it didn't really take long for conditions to almost deteriorate within that bunker. And that was only a few hours, so you couldn't really imagine, you know, several weeks. Uh, to have the physical systems in place for that long is a challenge in and of itself, you know, to have the septic and the electric and the air filtration and all the other life-sustaining systems that you would need would be a major challenge in itself but to actually have to entertain all those people for that period of time and to make sure that they don't kill one another is going to be something which will be very hard to achieve. Now there's going to be many factors that are related to whether or not people can endure such conditions and actually keep it together. The first one is of course the resilience and the attitude of the people within it. You know, whether the survival situation is viewed as hopeful or hopeless or whether people are optimistic or pessimistic, that's going to make a huge difference. You know, only the mentally strong and those who can view the situation in a rational way are going to be able to keep it together under these conditions. Really, any motion under these conditions could be detrimental. Even the euphoric ones could lead to poor decision making. So keeping a level head, keeping a rational state of mind and a logical state of mind is going to be absolutely crucial. Now the other predicting factor is people's mental health disposition. So any sort of pre-existing mental health condition or diagnosis, whether it be personality disorder, anxiety disorder, depression, uh, any sort of psychosis of sorts, if people are off their medication, then that's going to be a big problem. Impulse disorders like ADHD obsessive compulsiveness these are all things that are going to significantly impact a person's ability to maintain a cool head under these conditions but emotional stability will be absolutely crucial any people also who are struggling with addiction be it substance dependence or any sort of process addiction like gambling sex internet stuff like that they're going to be struggling with withdrawal from some aspect of the grid so they're definitely going to be temperamental and they're not going to be emotionally stable so that's something to consider now some people who are dependent on psychiatric medication will also go into some form of withdrawal and that's going to definitely have negative psychological effects now another factor is people's intellect and their problem solving capacity which will certainly be factors that offset the adversity of the situation at hand also the group's ability to cohesively and effectively communicate with each other is going to determine whether or not the group's functions well or everybody's at each other's throats and trying to kill each other so the politics and the hierarchy of the bunker must be as democratic or at least perceived to be as democratic as possible in order to foster peace Additionally, some sort of simulated night and day sleep cycle, if we're talking underground, is going to have to be simulated in order to foster a social balance. Based on some psychological studies they've done in the past, they know that human beings' circadian rhythm is actually 25 hours, not 24 hours, and that's been demonstrated in studies where people are not exposed to sunlight for prolonged periods of time they go on a 24-hour sleep cycle so there's going to have to be some sort of agreed upon night and day within the facility where things are powered down and of course uh, during the day things would be during the simulated day things would be powered up and this may or may not be in sync what's happening topside and it's not going to be long before people lose track of time of course so this is definitely going to be essential now, of course novel sensory stimuli is going to be required to keep people's minds busy so entertainment will be absolutely essential if you're talking about a situation like this the lack of stimulation is going to cause people to go crazy literally and there's a really simple way of understanding this and it's that if there's nowhere to go outside the only place to go is inside so entertainment is not only a convenient luxury if you're talking about a long-term situation with uh, large groups of people in a confined space it's an absolute need indeed idle time is the devil's plaything. if you want to know how things might play out if you didn't have that adequate degree of entertainment Watch the movie called The Divide. That might give you a theoretical understanding of how that scenario could play out if people did not have something to occupy their time. 
Now additionally, lack of sunlight is going to contribute to mood disorders. There is a psychological illness called seasonal affective disorder and basically it's the result of the lack of sunlight in the winter so people tend to get more depressed in the winter. Now if you're talking about permanent lack of sunlight you're going to have to have some really good natural lighting systems in there to simulate the sunlight in order to enhance the serotonin production in the brain and serotonin is just sort of a feel-good chemical which is kind of offsetting the depressed mood of it that everybody's probably going to be in if they're in that situation and of course if people are slipping into depression you're looking at issues like suicide and self-harm and now another thing that's going to compromise the situation might be the uncertainty factor and that's going to amount to the lack of information about what's going on inside the lack of intel and having to reside within this enclosed space for an indeterminate length of time is going to elevate the stress level of all the people who are in there. Whereas if they had some sort of goal about when they would be getting out of this shelter, it might provide some psychological comfort. Maybe not even a goal related to when they're getting out of the shelter, but just a group goal period. Anything to orient the group towards the future and get them working towards something perhaps greater than themselves would probably take people out of that depressed mode and get them. However, the reality is likely that in most instances where you're going to be forced into a long-term bunker, chances are you're not going to have the luxury of knowing what's going on topside. In addition to this, any uncertainty means that there's going to have to be choices that are made by the group. And when you have choices that need to be made, that's going to require deliberation. And of course, deliberation can potentially lead to disagreements which can potentially lead to conflict and of course that can definitely destroy the colony from the inside out. So any sort of pre-established processes that people can agree upon when doing these deliberations would be beneficial just in case things did get out of hand and this process should strive to be as democratic as possible as mentioned before. Now of course the amount of space and compartmentalization within a bunker and the novelty of the contents therein may offset some of the aforementioned challenges. Although this may not be realistically achievable for the average person, chances are you're gonna have four walls and you're gonna be forced to reside within it. But the bigger and more diverse the bunker can be, the better, and I think that goes without saying. Now, as for the operational security aspects of bunkering in, what to do in terms of what's happening topside, I'm going to leave that to the military strategist to speculate on. Now the point of this video is just to get people familiar with the realities of residing within a bunker long term. Hopefully open some lines of communication and thought about the matter. Because every hour in a bunker is certainly potentially going to feel like a day. And I really look forward to hearing your guys' comments on this because I'm sure there's a lot here that I haven't considered. There's a lot that could go awry and, you know, there's a lot of ways to mitigate and offset those issues which could arise. So let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section. I do look forward to reading them and hopefully responding. And one last thing I want to say about this whole idea of bunkering in is that we still are in the embryonic phase of prepping. So the doomsday bunker is kind of on par with the inch bag in terms of its sophistication and exaggeration. So living indefinitely out of a bug out bag or living in a hole in the ground for years at a time are both unrealistic scenarios. And I think we are starting to move away from that. Now if anything a bunker is a great storage facility. It's a great uh, last ditch castle keep so to speak but depending on it solely for your OPSEC in a post-collapse environment may well be your demise if you don't consider the psychological factors that I've just discussed. So I hope this has been a thought-provoking video. By all means like, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper Out. Check out the Canadian Prepper Network blog an excellent resource for Canadian survivalists and preppers.